Hey everybody, welcome to Crosswinds Church, where we're all about this vision of growing closer to God and going into our worlds. No matter who you are or where you're joining us from, there's a place here for you. If you'd like to attend one of our services, you can go to cwcmv.org forward slash sermons to check out the times, upcoming sermons, as well as view previous sermons. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the service. I read about a group of seminary students that had decided they were going to do an interesting experiment. They took a pair of scissors and they went after their Bible and began cutting out of the Bible every verse that had to do with wealth or poverty or justice or oppression. Their goal was to come up with a compassionless Bible. That was their stated goal. In the end, after they had done that, they ended up with some 2,000 verses littering the floor below them. Now, I find this kind of funny. I don't know whether it's true or not, whether they actually did that, but I, I find it kind of interesting because I don't know about you, but in order to not deal with certain verses, I don't literally have to take scissors to my Bible. I, I'm very capable of just ignoring the verses that I don't like, the things that I don't want to do. Amen? <laughs> now, I don't hesitate quite often to say that I am a Christian. I, I am, I'm pretty open about that. But what does it really mean to be a Christian? Well, literally, it means to be a follower of Christ. Well, then, of course, that begs the question, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? We could just keep going on with this. So what's that mean? Last Sunday, Jackie and I went and saw a film, kind of an art film, I suppose. I haven't seen it in wide relief, but I was released. But I was interested in what it said about the film. It was entitled A Hidden Life. And it was about a particular individual who was a, uh, a farmer in Austria back in the um, early 40s uh, during the Nazi regime when the Nazis came in and, uh, and took over uh, Austria. And all of the, the citizens there in Austria were required to swear allegiance to Hitler. And this particular farmer couldn't do this. And uh, it's, it's a true story, by the way. And I thought, actually, it was the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, just written in a different way. But actually, I've, I've done some research, and this was a real guy. He was an objector to the Nazi regime. As a result, they put him in prison, and ultimately, he was executed. Interesting film. There's a scene in the film where this individual, who is a, a fairly a devout Catholic, he goes to the various, uh, well, he goes to the priest, and then went to even higher church authorities to find out, you know, wh- wh- what are we supposed to do? Some of their advice were revolved around, well, just say the words the government wants you to say, but think otherwise. Uh, they talked about, of course, we're supposed to be, according to scripture, submissive to the, the governing authorities, but he couldn't get over the fact that they are requiring me to swear allegiance to the Fuhrer, to Adolf Hitler, and he wouldn't do it. There's one scene where he's in the church, and there's a guy painting frescoes on the wall, on the walls and on the ceiling of this particular church. And he's admiring the paintings of Jesus that he sees there. And the guy said something that I thought was very key. I, I wrote it down even as we're watching the film. And it, he said this. He says, I'm painting a Jesus that people can handle. I'm painting the Jesus that, that people want to see. He said, maybe someday I'll be brave enough to actually paint the real Jesus. The Jesus who he really was. He says right now, and here's the phrase he used. He says right now, I am painting a Jesus for people who are admirers of Jesus. Not for people who are followers of Jesus. And I thought, wow. I mean, that that, that makes me think. I'm like, okay, am I an admirer of Jesus? Well, yeah, but hopefully it doesn't end there. I mean, I admire what Jesus did. I admire the way he lived his life and certainly admire what he did for me. But am, that, hopefully it doesn't end there. But sadly, I think in a lot of our churches and in a lot of our lives, it does end there. We admire what Jesus did 
when we're actually called to be followers of Christ. So again, I ask the question, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? Well, many people this morning are going to preach uh, in, in pulpits here in the United States and around the world that they say that being a, a follower of Jesus Christ means that your life is going to be happy and successful and fulfilling and purposeful. It's sort of like the sin and decadence of the world around you isn't really going to affect you. Well, if that's what you think it is, then I suggest you get out a pair of scissors because you need to do some surgery on your Bible. What did Jesus himself say about our lives? He says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Look at verse 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Follow me where? Well, the context. You must follow me in suffering and rejection and even death to self and ultimately being raised up to new life. Verse 24, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one that will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his own soul? That's from the mouth of Jesus. Now, what did, what did one of his followers, one of his main disciples, Peter, say? Here's what Peter said of this whole thing. Beloved, speaking to us now, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Do you realize what he's saying there? He's essentially saying that the strange thing would be if there wasn't some fiery trial happening to you. It would be strange if you were not experiencing some type of persecution. Verse 13, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that, at, that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. For if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure, however, because if, don't get reviled for this, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler, you know, I stole something and everybody's getting on my back. I guess I'm suffering for Christ. No, you're suffering because you stole something, okay? <laughs> but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, I know you may argue and say, well, that was written 2,000 years ago. Trust me, it's still in effect today. We're still being judged. We're still experiencing these things. Someone had once said that God has made man in his own image and man has been returning the favor ever since. <laughs> Meaning we then like to, to make God in our own image. And as tough as it is to read sometimes, I want to put down the scissors and I want to know what God says. I want to at least understand what it is if I'm going to reject it, at least what it is I'm rejecting. As Pastor Paul said last week, uh, doing that will enable us then to make our lives count here on earth and on into eternity. We're in this series right now, Outlive Your Life. And here's how Pastor Paul defined that last week. He said, outliving our lives is maximizing our time, our talents, and our treasures that God has given to us. And in, in so living an, out, living an abundant life in God, overflowing into others so that they too can discover a new life in Jesus. Outliving my life, in a word, is a legacy. It means that the world is different since I've, I've been here. That, that things are better since I have been here. I would like you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. We're going to pick it up at verse 14. Also, I encourage you to take the note cards that you were given at the door. Take those out. There'll be some things to, to write down, fill in, and uh, any thoughts you might have as well. Uh, also, uh, on the back of the cards, once again, we've started, as Caleb mentioned earlier, our life groups. And so uh, there are life group questions which you can feel free to use in your own debrief of the service. But also, if you're not in a life group, I encourage you, get involved in one. We, we, were, uh, we had a great life group this week at ours, and so uh, I'd want you to experience that as well. If you're streaming live with us this morning, then I want to encourage you that all of the information, the materials I've told you about are also available on the church app. Well, today we're going to see in Scripture, as the title suggests, that when it comes to being a follower of Jesus Christ, the poor of all people are a priority for him. And so let's start right there with some questions. The first one, maybe the most important one, what does the Bible say about this topic, about all of this? 
Now, as we've already seen, cutting the poor out of Scripture, creating a compassionless Bible, really, uh, it, it guts the Bible. Let me give you some examples of what is said about the poor. In James, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Proverbs 9, 22 says, He who is generous will be blessed, for he gives some of his food to the poor. Or again, the righteous is concerned for the rights of the poor. The wicked, they don't understand such a concern. So what does Jesus think about the poor. Well, in this passage here, Luke chapter 4, Jesus is back in his hometown. He's ultimately going to be rejected by them, not in the least of which for some of the things that we're going to see him say here. Some have actually termed this his, his Nazareth manifesto. So let's look at what he says. Verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And then he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, as was his custom. And he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book, and he found the place where it was written. Now Jesus is about to read the first and only time in Scripture that we see Jesus reading. But he's going to start reading in Isaiah 61, verse 18 here in, in, uh, uh, in our passage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Verse 20, and then he closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant. He sat down and all of the eyes of the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is saying, Isaiah was talking about me. And they knew that Isaiah 61, that's a messianic prophecy. They knew what Jesus was saying, and it got him into some trouble with them a little bit later. But the key thing here, guys, is if you want to be a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you will do what he will do. And right here, he's telling us what he will do. You want more confirmation? Later on, John the Baptist, the one who came before Jesus, the one who was to, to proclaim the coming of the Lord, he had been imprisoned. And then he began to have doubts about whether Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. And here's what he says. When John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples. And he said to Jesus, are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. Because words, as we've said before, are easy. You can say anything you want. But look what he's doing. Verse 5. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, does this sound familiar? The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. In other words, I'm doing all the things the Messiah is here to do. Ergo, that's what it means to be a follower of Christ. Jesus is telling us what he will do and, and what he did and what he continues to do. Here it is. Preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for prisoners, proclaim recovery of sight for the blind, release the oppressed, and proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. Now that interesting last phrase there, the year of our Lord's favor. It's talking about there specifically the year of Jubilee. If you know anything about Jewish history, Old Testament history, the year of Jubilee was a, was a, a year when all the debts in society were canceled, when all the slaves were, set, were, were to be set free, when all the property in the society reverted back to the original owners. And this was something that was supposed to happen every uh, two years, every century. Every, uh, every 50 years, a little less than that, 49 years, that that was supposed to happen. We don't have any record that it ever did happen. Nevertheless, it is a command of God that there would be a year of jubilee. And the, person, the idea was to be a reset on society, if you will. One person termed it this way. They called it a regularly scheduled revolution. Wouldn't that be a case in our case? I mean, imagine if all your debts were canceled, that feels good, but then your property goes back to the original owner. That doesn't sound so good, <laughs> unless I originally had some property somewhere. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's very revolutionary. And the purpose behind this is that every family would have a chance then to get back on its feet. It was intended, it was put into place by God, and, and God's sovereign and, and all-knowing, and he knew they were never going to do it. 
But it was intended to prevent what we see instead in society and certainly what they saw in their society, that permanent underclass. In other words, people would still be rich. I would imagine after 49 years, you'd probably see the same divisions. The people that are good at making money are going to make money, and the people that aren't good at making money are not going to do so well. But they, you could still be rich, but you could not then forever build your wealth on the backs of the poor. It tells me that God's design is that there be a level playing field for everyone so that the, the have-nots and the have-a-lots are, aren't so far apart that they can't see each other. We're supposed to exist together. Now, of course, the question then comes to me uh, that I think about is, are we living according to God's design today? Well, obviously, no. Look around us. L look at our society. In fact, I did some uh, statistical research this week for a message like this. And according to the UN Human Development Report, three quarters of the world's income goes to 20% of the population. Now, those are just numbers, so let me give you a picture of it. Suppose there's a valley, and in this valley, there are, say, uh, 10 farmers and 10 cows in this valley. Now, we know what fair would be, but in fact, in our society, this is how those numbers break down. Two farmers have eight cows, and eight farmers share two cows. And that's pretty much the, the state of the world we live in today. Guys, we cannot escape the fact, and as much as we might want to, I know people would say, well, that's socialism. Well, no, it's biblical, okay? We're, we're talking about what the Bible says here. And we can't escape the fact that Scripture teaches us that we are not only to share the gospel with people in order to impact their spirit, we are also to impact their, their bodies. We are also to help them not just spiritually, but physically, we are, to, we are to, to help them for their temporal needs, their, their ongoing day-by-day -day needs, as well as their eternal needs. An example of this, write down, we won't go there, but in Acts chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 16, you see an account of Peter and John healing a crippled beggar, but what happens after they heal that beggar? Well, then Peter preaches to the onlookers, and people get saved. And so this physical healing developed a spiritual hunger for spiritual healing. There's no two ways about it, guys. Scripture is chock full of concern for the poor. So if you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you can't get around it unless you want to cut your Bible up. Let's, let's ask a couple of questions concerning this. Let's, let's personalize it. The first one is this, and you hear this a lot around here. Who is in your world? We use these cards. If you're new today, then you're going to hear something new. But on your way out in between the doors, there are these cards. And this is the way we as a church, Crosswinds Church, we fulfill the Great Commission. We go to our world. In other words, there are certain people that are in our worlds, our family, our friends, our, our neighbors, our co-workers, our fellow students, uh, wh whoever they are. We, we ask on this card, there's five steps we ask you to take. You first pray and ask the Lord, who are the people that you want me to be targeting, that you want me to be recognizing as they are specifically in my world, the 8 to 15 people that I have an impact in? And you put them down, you list them here, and I always leave, as I've shared before, I always leave a couple of extra blanks. Because I think there's times, well, I don't think, I know, there's times when God brings people into my life that, uh, that I hadn't anticipated. Somebody shows up or, you know, the, 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 uh, the clerk across the counter at the retail store or whatever. And so I want to be praying for them as well. And I'm praying, and I hope you are too, for opportunities to have an impact in their life. And then I'm looking for ways to, to share the gospel with them if that's their need. And, and the people on here aren't always Christians. Maybe, maybe share uh, how they can grow in their walk with Christ. And then I'm also using this as a, as a motivator for me to prepare myself to be able to minister effectively uh, to people like that. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't yet, or if you have, maybe it's time to, you know, maybe uh, do an update and see how things are going with your cards. But let's be in, in, uh, in active um, participation in this. The thing is, guys, when we talk about who is in our world, that, that, that uh, emphasizes the point that God has equipped us to relate to certain people more so than other people. Not just uh, geographically, but some people are in my family, so I'm closer to them. I have more of an interest in some people uh, than other people do. When it comes to ministry, there's certain types of ministry that you might be more suited to or more apt to do than other types. You know, I, I uh, was a youth pastor for 25 years, and people used to always say to me, I love the fact that you like being with those teenagers because that's not what I want to do. And, and I used to think, man, I'm the luckiest guy in the church. I get to have the best job of all, but that's, that's the way we're wired. That's the way God has, has planned for us to do things. 
You know, uh, I, uh, and I've said it many times, you know, it's, it's important that uh, in working with teens, that's the group that I identify with, but then, you know, don't stick me with children or, or down in the nursery. They'll live, okay? I can, uh, it's not dangerous. If you see me, I, I told them in first service after I said some of this, I said, you know, if you see me in the children's ward, don't set up an alarm. Don't tell squat team that, you know, the pastor's down here. It, it, the kids are okay, okay? It, it's just that, and, and I could actually teach their class. I, I can, uh, I, I sort of anyway. <laughs> One time I was, uh, I was a substitute teacher for a number of years, and, um, and I was sent to, uh, and I always told them, I want to do junior high or high school alone. And usually that gave me plenty of work, because the vast majority of subs don't want to do junior high or high school. And so I usually got my way. There was one exception. I was sent to this school to do a sixth grade class, and it turned out they didn't need somebody by the time I got there. And they said, but we do need somebody in the kindergarten class. And I'm like, oh my goodness, kindergarten? And I said, I, I tried to get out of it. I can't do that. I'm not, I'm not, that's not my people. And he said, no, no, it's okay. You can do this. So finally, I'm like, okay, to help you out, I'll do this. So I go in there, and these kids are so immature. I mean, they're all over the place. I don't know how my wife did it <laughs> with our kids. <laughs> and so at one point, you know, I'm thinking, okay, what do I know about teaching kids? I know that, you know, there's, they're, they're acting up, and they're being kids, right? And I, I remembered, okay, what you need to do first off is get down on their level if you really want to communicate to them. So that's what I did. I got down on this, this one little ornery kid, and I, and I got him in front of me, and I got down on his level, eye to eye, and I did this exact thing. I said, you need to do what I say. <laughs> and you know what re reaction I got from him? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> And not only was that bad enough, then he started setting others off. And, and suddenly I got half the class crying on me. And so fortunately, I had thought to bring my guitar that day for some reason. I had it in the trunk of my car, so I get my guitar out, and I'm like, let's all sing. And I, you know, I managed to get them. So we did a lot of marching around, singing songs and, and stuff like that that morning. But never again did I ever want to do that. I, I have a deal with Lorinda Fiddler, the, the director of our nursery, okay? I won't go to the nursery, and she won't preach sermons. And we're both okay with that. We're, we're just fine with that. That's how we're wired, all right? God, that's how God designed you. In fact, uh, in Romans uh, 12, it says, In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. And, and if you don't know what your gift is, or maybe you're, you're struggling, well, where am I best suited? Well, we have a class for that. We have our step series, step in, step up, and then step out. And the step out class, I know many of you have been a part of it, but it actually helps you to discern what your spiritual gift is and where your, your passions lie so that you can be in the right place. As I said, if I had to go to the nursery right now because there's nobody else to do it, that's fine. I know how to do it. They'll, they'll live. I know how to change diapers. I could probably even keep them entertained. If I had to do that every week, it wouldn't pay, take too long. It'd take about one week for me to dread going to church. And sometimes I think people dread going to church because they're just in the wrong place. They're doing something that somebody said, you need to do this because nobody else is doing it. Well, that's not the reason to do it. You do it because this is how God has called you, how he's wired you, the passion he's given to you. And that actually prompts the second question, do you really, who do you really care about? That's the real question. Who do you, not, not that you don't care about others, but, but who has it that God has uniquely gifted you to reach out to? We each have different burdens emotionally. In Psalm 33, it says, The Lord looks from heaven and he sees all the sons of men. From his dwelling place, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. And here's the key, verse 15. He, meaning the Lord, who fashions the hearts of them all, who understands all their works. God has created us not only with different passions and gifts and abilities, but also with different burdens. There's different things. Like people come to me and they'll say, Pastor, why aren't we reaching out to this person or these, this group of people? And, you know, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I know the need is there, but I guess I haven't had the passion that you've had. Obviously, God is calling you into that area. How can I equip you to reach out into that area? What is it that your heart breaks for? You know, we, we see it in Jesus' life. In Matthew 9, 35, it says Jesus was going through all the cities and villages and teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And then here's the key. Seeing the people, Jesus felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep 
without a shepherd. That word compassion is an interesting word in the Greek. Let's see if I can say it. Splang nidza omni. Okay? And you don't know if I said that right or not, right? So <laughs> I could say booga, booga, booga. <laughs> now that probably doesn't sound too Greek. Anyway, <laughs> but here's the key of what I'm getting at. What it means is to be moved as to one's bowels. Yep, he said it. <laughs> I mean, think about it. When you're really moved by something, does that not where it, affect, where it affects you? I, I think about it in terms of like if I'm driving along and I'm maybe doing something wrong, going a little fast, and the red light pops up in my, in my rear view mirror, and uh, I feel it in my gut, ugh, you know. And, and, that's, and, and see, the ancients thought that was where love and compassion and pity was seated. So that's why they came up with a word like that. That is where they say you feel compassion. And so there's a good question. What is the burden that God has given to you? And together with our church family, we need to ask our second question this morning, and that is this. What should the church be doing? Take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 6. We're going to pick that up in, group, in verse 1. Now, just a little background. This is the early church. And we're going to see how they operated. And they had, a, 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 they had problems. They're a normal church, just like the rest of us. In particular, there was a problem with some of the widows. Widows had it tough in society, as we'll see in a minute. Verse 1 starts like this. Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, in other words, the church was growing, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Hellenistic Jews are Greek Jews, okay? They're, they're not Jewish. These widows, they're not Jewish by, by uh, nationality, okay? These widows, they had it rough. A widow had it hard, and these widows in particular, because by virtue of being a widow, now you don't have a husband to take care of you. That already uh, hurts you. That's already a, a, a mark against you. But then they have this additional burden. Now that they've come to Jesus Christ, their families have disowned them. And so they have nobody, no family members. That often in, in those societies, families would even hold funerals. So here these Greek-speaking women were overlooked. Now, why were they overlooked? Well, you know, they were people, right? So we can imagine they're immigrants, they're outsiders. They, they speak with an accent. Maybe they don't even speak the language at all. And so what did the apostles do? That's what we see next. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples, and they said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task, and we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And this statement found approval with the whole congregation. And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many priests were becoming obedient to the faith. You see, this problem of inequality that they had going on in their society required the entire church get involved. The, the apostles wanted every member to know just how important this is. In fact, you could make a case that this was the first business meeting that the early church had, and that was the topic. They wanted to solve this problem, and so what did they do? They called out their best and their brightest, seven men full of the spirit and of wisdom. And this meeting led to this task force, the best people dealing with the biggest problem. And folks, that's what we have in our society today. Our people, we need our best. We need our brightest. Working on the problems of the poor in our society. And boy, is it not a problem. I mean, we see it increasingly in the national news. Rich Stearns, uh, at that time, the president of World Vision, said, poverty is rocket science. We can't seem to get a handle on it. Pastor Paul asked the question last week, when we see how God moved in the book of Acts, can he, could he, and would he do it again today? Well, I'll tell you what. I can't control what God can, could, and would do, but I can control what I do. And so the question is, am I willing to behave like the people in the book of Acts, like Scripture is teaching me? If, I could, if they could mobilize over a few hungry widows, then what about me? What about us? Jesus walked into the temple in John chapter 2. And he, and he saw how they were treating God's house. 
but, you, but something you may catch if you read that passage, not only, well, you may not catch it by reading the passage, but one of the things that was happening was that the poor were being cheated. When they were lending, they, they were doing money changing, a lot of those guys were cheating the people that they were changing money for. That's where they made their profit. And Jesus was incensed at this. And what did it do? It caused him to tear the place up. And later his disciples remembered that it was said of him that zeal for my house would consume me. Here's Jesus Christ, loses all sense of propriety in the temple of God of all places and seems to go nuts. He was angry. We like to soften it sometimes and we have to say, well, he was righteously indignant. Yeah, well, okay, call it what you want. But it prompted him to action. He makes a whip by, after all. He goes after these guys. So we need to ask ourselves in light of the behavior of the one whom we are to follow, are we comfortable with all of this? Are we comfortable? Have we become comfortable with this society that we're living in? You see, our problem is that quite often we have learned to coexist with poverty. It doesn't really bother us anymore. Jesus said, of course, you know, you'll always have the poor with you, but that doesn't mean you don't do anything about it. You read all of scripture. Yes, they're always going to be there. That means the need is always going to be there. We're always going to have to do something about it. And yet we like to think in terms of being out of sight and out of mind. I heard a illustration years ago, and I've never had the guts to do it straight the way it was done, but it was very effective because I still remember it 30 years later. So I'll, I'll share the illustration with you amended, and you'll see why in a minute. This guy was speaking about reaching out to the poor and about the problem of poverty in the world today, and here's what he said, almost. He said, a billion people went to bed hungry today, and most of you don't give a blank about it. Only he didn't say blank. <laughs> and he says that in a church service. And I, along with everybody else, we were like, oh, you could have heard a pin drop. Like, <gasps> there was an audible gasp in the room. And he waited. And then he followed up with this. And furthermore, right now, most of you are more angry that I said blank than the fact that a billion people went to bed hungry today. And I was like, ouch. <laughs> because he was exactly right. All I was thinking about was he said that word. I can't believe he would talk like that. Now, I obviously am not going to say it either, but I, I think it gets the point across. I've become so complacent about it that, yeah, you know, a billion people, but that's a, a billion people. That's, that's people that aren't eating, people that have no place to stay, people for whom, you know, the, the little bit of change that I have in my pocket is a huge amount of money for them. When it comes to the inequities of poverty, guys, we should be riled up. We should be angry. We should be at least righteously indignant if we want to be followers of Jesus Christ. Don't you think? So often, poverty doesn't exist because of a lack of charity. There's a huge amount of charity in our world, and it certainly doesn't exist because of a lack of resources. Again, statistically speaking, I did study on this last week, we make one and a half times the amount of food necessary to feed everybody in the world. And that's worldwide, food production is one and a half times. We have, you know, half as much food left over that would be able to feed everyone in the world. So there should be plenty of food, plenty of resources. What we seem to lack is a sense of fairness. I go to third world countries regularly, and I see men in those countries, they have the same talents, the same gifts that I have. They're able and often willing to work and often work a lot harder than I do. They love their families. They love God. They have good reputations. And yet they still make in one, they make in one year what I spend on gas in one month. Why? Well, it's a complex answer, I know. I mean, there's political systems involved. There's, there, there's societal issues but part of it, if you want to boil it down, is that guy who, who's like me in every way was just born in the wrong place in order to be able to experience what I experienced. Bono, the, the pop singer, activist, once put it this way. He said, they are accidents of latitude. They were born in places where there is no libraries, no vaccinations, no clean water, no paved roads. I was born in Southern California. I had all of those things. But trust me, guys, I learned this yesterday as I went out with our, our, our street ministry team. You don't have to go to the third world to find them. They're out there on the streets of Moreno Valley. They're in convalescent homes and jails and juvenile hall and the unemployment office. They're in the field across the street from Home Depot. Now, granted, there are poor people in our society today because they're lazy. 
and they need to get up and work. The Bible says if you won't work, then you shouldn't eat. But we live in a society here in the United States right now where there's a 3.5% unemployment rate. If that's a 50-year low. There are uh, employers don't have enough people to employ, and it's only going to get worse for the employer, better for the employees, because us baby boomers are retiring at greater and greater numbers every week. But many of the people around the uh, world, the poor around the world, they're victims. And I wonder, do you think maybe they need a year of jubilee? They need a reset. You know, when Jesus said that, what he was declaring was, I am the year of Jubilee. I am the one that's going to set everything right. I am the one that's going to make everything fair. Well, guys, we have also been called to minister on behalf of Jesus Christ. We have been called to bring that. Now, we can't do everything. Neither could the disciples. But each of us can do something. No doubt you've heard the starfish story, but let me tell it again for those who have it. A grandfather and his grandson were walking along the beach one day, and there had been a, an, an interesting anomaly, a maritime anomaly, that had caused thousands of starfish to be washed up on the beach. And here's all these starfish wiggling and writhing on the beach. And this little boy was going to town. He was running out there, and he was grabbing starfish and throwing them back into the ocean, and grabbing a starfish and throwing it back into the ocean, and grabbing a starfish. And, 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 and the grandpa was watching this, and he says, you know... Uh, you know, son, you're not really making all that big a difference. And the kid, to his credit, reached down, grabbed another starfish, and threw it in the ocean, turned to his grandpa and said, I made a difference for that one. And guys, that's how we have to look at this, because it's going to be greater than any of us could do. I read of the number of uh, excuses that we come up with, and I've come up with many of these myself. Excuses for not reaching out to the poor. And no doubt you will recognize some of these. First one, they don't deserve help. They got themselves into poverty. Let them get themselves out. Another one, God's call to help the poor applies to another time. Boy, what a cop out. <laughs> well, that's in biblical times. That's the first century. Excuse me, I think there's more poor today than there were then, okay? I don't know any poor people. There's no poor people in my world. All I can say to that is, you're just not looking. Uh, you, you're, you're passing them by all the time. I used to call them the invisible people. I remember one time we were ministering at, at a, uh, uh, at, down in uh, Skid Row in Los Angeles. And the guy told a story, true story, of, of a guy who was living on the streets. This was like 30 years ago. He's living on the streets, and he says, and somebody came up and was talking to him, and the guy said, can you see me? And he said, yes. And he said, you really? You can see me? And the reason he was asking that is because he was so used to people not paying attention to him, walking past him, not looking at him, not responding when he said something, when they said something to him, or when he said something to them, that he actually had convinced himself that he was somehow invisible. And so that when this Christian came up and said, started talking to him, he was amazed, you actually see me, you can see me. And guys, when we say, I don't know any poor people, I would submit to you, you're just not looking. They are all around. I have my own needs. Any money I give will just be wasted or stolen or spent on other things. The poor won't ever see it. I may become a victim myself. How about this? I don't know where to start. I don't have the time. My little bit won't make a difference. Well, it'll make a difference to that one. Yeah, yesterday we didn't make a difference in terms of changing people's lives totally over, although we do make that difference when we have the opportunity to share the gospel. Then we are making a total difference. But yesterday it was to give them some food for that moment. But we're doing something. We made a difference in that moment. And one thing, guys, is certain. As long as we're making excuses, then nothing is going to get done. Why not, instead of saying, coming up with all the reasons why we can't do it, why not start talking instead about what can be done and what I should be doing? Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, his, his masterpiece. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's why we exist. That's our purpose which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And we have groups of individuals here at Crosswinds. We have our street ministry, which I have a tremendous amount of respect for, who reach out to people in need. We have uh, Crosswinds Cares that served this past uh, holiday season. We have our food pantry, which, guys, by, well, by the way, our food pantry right now is overflowing with food. Now, that doesn't mean go there and get yourself some food. It means that we have supplies, we have resources for people in your worlds that are without our children regularly put together, they have a, they put together a series of blessing bags, which are simple toiletries and stuff that we can give out to people that are living on the street. Maybe you need to get involved. 
Our life groups regularly take on projects. And it's true that as one person, I may not be able to do much, but man, when we gather together, I always like that cartoon where Linus, Linus and Lucy of Peanuts fame, and she's watching, or he's watching television, and Lucy walks in, plops down on the couch, and says, change the channel. And he says, well, what makes you think you can just march in here and take over? And she says, these five fingers, individually, they're nothing. But when I coil them together into a single unit, they, come, they become a power mighty to behold. <laughs> to which Linus responds, what channel would you like? <laughs> and guys, that's us. When we talk about a force mighty to behold, what about the first church? Look at what it says about them in Acts chapter 2. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and their possessions and were sharing with them all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? Well, there it is right there. There's a big picture of it right there for you. And I believe God can do it again to answer Paul's question from last week. And I believe God wants to do it again. In fact, I know that he wants to do it again. And I want to be a part of it. How about you? And, you know, as I think about this passage, here are some thoughts I came away with. Maybe it's, uh, it'll ring with you as well. What do I do with the Bible's words concerning the poor? Ask yourself that question. You know, is this a, a topic that you're just having to tolerate because obviously the pastor's on this kick this morning? Or, or is this something that, that goes beyond this room? Secondly, how can I support what my church is doing? There's things already happening. How can I be a part of that? That's the best way. Go out, get involved. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the street ministry team is, is going out all the time. And so ask yourself, how can I, not, not just to support the church, but to be a follower of Christ, which is our original question. And then thirdly, we go again, how do I really feel about poverty? Often when I teach evangelism, I tell people there's three reasons people don't evangelize, and it strikes me that it fits for this as well. The number one reason people don't evangelize, well, one reason, I don't, they're not ranked, but one reason is uh, they don't know how. So let's say, you know, I don't know how to go, I, I, I feel bad about it because I don't know what to do. Well, we can teach you that, okay? Uh, you can go, if, if you don't feel comfortable going with the street ministry team, just go and just hang out. <laughs> just, just watch what's happening. Trust me, you'll want to get involved. It won't take too long. Secondly, so I don't know how, we can teach you. Secondly, uh, I'm afraid to. You know, those people kind of scare me. Well, we can help you with that too. We can take you alongside. We can help you to conquer that fear. The third one is one that I personally, nor anyone in this room, can do anything about. And that is, I don't care to do anything. I don't care about the poor. They don't bother me. I don't bother them. I can't do anything about that. That's unbiblical. That's, 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 that's contrary to being a follower of Christ. But the only thing that's going to conquer that is you saying that I want to be filled with the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that's going to change that attitude in you. And before anything is going to change, that's what you have to do. Ephesians 5.18, not to be drunk with wine, we're into excess, but to be filled with the Spirit, controlled and empowered by Him. As I said, I want to be a part of what God is doing, and I believe that I am. And, and, I, and I hope that you want to be a part of it as well. But if you don't, well, then... Uh, I got a pair of scissors up here, and you can get started and take care of your Bible so it lines up with how you actually want to live your life. Is that, is that uh, meddling enough for you? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we, uh, it's a tough word. It's a tough thing to hear today. And Lord, it's, uh, it's, it comes across, I think, Father, as an easy answer, but it is so difficult. It is rocket science, as, as Rich Stern said. And yet, Lord, you've never given us a command to do something where you don't also give us the power and ability to do it through your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, again, I just come back to that point. Lord, fill me with your Spirit. May my, my desires be your desires. May, my com may your compassion become my compassion. May, may my heart break 
for the things that break your heart. And Lord, if I just do that one step, just start there, there's going to be a world of change, not only in my life, but in the life of Crosswinds Church. We're going to be that church that people will look at us and say, something's different about them. What is it? Because I want it. Father, that's what you want. That's what I want. I hope that's what we all want. And Lord, as we give right now, I pray that we're giving cheerfully, that we're giving with an attitude of, I get to do this, not that I have to do this, so that this message of hope and encouragement can be spread far and wide, not only throughout Moreno Valley, but Lord, literally throughout the world, through our ministries that go worldwide. We thank you for the ability you give us to give. Lord, change us, mold us, make us into the people you want us to be. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Here at Crosswinds, we believe this vision of growing and going can change your life and the world around you. Crosswinds Church is a nonprofit, which means it operates from gifts given from people just like you. When you give, your money goes to creating opportunities for people to grow and go all over the world. I would love for you to be a part of that. And you can give a gift right now by clicking on the Give button in the top right corner of this page or you can go to cwcmv.org slash give. Join us and join what God is doing through this vision of growing and going. And have a great day.